It's wonderful to be here with all of you this morning. I've uh, been excited to be able to present this in particular study. It's one that's been on my mind for a little while, but I've never put all of my notes together on it in one kind of organized fashion. And so I have two chapters we'll be looking at as kind of the core scripture base for the study. One is in Acts, the seventh chapter, and the other is Acts, the 13th chapter. Two lessons given by two really incredible Christian men. In Acts 7, we have Stephen, and then in Acts 13, we have Paul. Both of these men have really incredible characteristics about them. And they interact with each other very heavily inside of Acts 6 and 7. And so one of the most common factors that we'll see across these two lessons that are given is both of these men use the history of the Bible and Bible storytelling in order to be able to communicate a message to their audience We're going to dig into some of the details of what that looks like and how we can be a part of that story as well. So to kick things off, I want to just give you a brief outline of what we're going to cover overall throughout the presentation today. First off, we're just going to talk a little bit about who Stephen and Paul were and what linked them together. Then we're going to compare the two lessons that these men taught in Acts 7 and Acts 13, two different lessons, but a lot of crossover things that they talk about. And then finally, we're going to talk about our part of that story and being able to preach the gospel in a continued manner, just like these two individuals did. So the circumstances surrounding chapters 6 and 7 of Acts is really filled with all kinds of different conflicts going on at the time. It was a very tumultuous period. The Romans were occupying Judea. The Roman Empire was spreading and growing, and there was all kinds of oversight that was happening to the Jewish people and the Jewish leaders that they hadn't necessarily had before. For instance, in a In this Roman occupation, we see the kings such as Herod the Great ruling in in 4 BC and later throughout, we see many appointed governors. That's where people like Pontius Pilate came into play during the time period of Jesus's death. And there was a great amount of of oversight that we saw from these, these different roles. So Pilate, for instance, was inside of the fulfillment of, sorry, my slide's messing up on me, inside of the fulfillment of the um, prophecies of how Jesus was going to die, he was going to be hung on a tree. Well, that crucifixion process was something that the Romans had a part of their execution practices, and the, the Sanhedrin, as well as the high priests, um, you know, they had trials for Jesus that they condemned him of the things that they were accusing him of, but then they brought him to Pilate. So Pilate would make the final judgment. And so we see as a a typical practice, especially when it comes to things such as capital punishment, the Roman, um, Roman governors really had to be the ones that were approving those things. And so interesting, interesting kind of dynamic going on And then the Romans were often, um, they had a a degree of tension that was happening just based upon the religious beliefs of the Jews. And they were heavily, you know, focused on on how they were taxing and the presence of soldiers inside of the different cities and the occasional clash between religious laws and the Roman laws caused just a lot of, of things going on. And then second here, we have this conflict internally between the Israelites' religious groups. There was the you know, Hebrew Jews or the Hebraic Jews, and then there was the Hellenistic uh, 
Jews, which is Greek-speaking Jews, and they had cultural differences that often caused tensions. In fact, in Acts the sixth chapter, we see some of those things coming into play whenever the the um, Hellenistic widows were uh, being neglected when it came to the daily distribution of food. And so Stephen, Stephen was actually amongst the men who were appointed as deacons by the apostles to oversee the fair distribution of resources. And so there's tensions happening culturally, even amongst the Jewish people. And then, of course, there was continued religious tensions happening. After Jesus' crucifixion, we you know, have the growth of the early Christian movement, and that often, or that, that came in direct conflict with people who wanted to hold on to the old law or the Mosaic law as the way in which they wanted to practice um, practice religiously. Then, a classic kind of running rivalry was between the Pharisees and the Sadducees, who had a difference in how they perceived. The resurrection. The Pharisees believed in the resurrection, and then the Sadducees did not. And so when you bring in the early Christian movement, where Jesus rising from the dead is a core part of that story, well, the Sadducees start to feel more threatened during that time period, and we eventually see their, uh, you know, their religious beliefs, you know, totally squashed out over time because it, it just, it just couldn't, um, well, I say that, but the Pharisees were able to grow a lot more inside of their, their, you know, power in this time period. And so Paul, Paul was a part of that group. He was a Pharisee. He was called Saul at the time period in which he acted in that fashion. So there's a lot going on. A lot of things happening during this time period. Now, we know a little bit about Stephen, but as far as people in the Bible go, we don't have a ton of different facts about him. But what we do know is fairly impressive. He has a, a pretty good resume that he could, uh, he could you know, show for himself, but as a, a Christian teacher and leader, he was well respected. Stephen was in Acts 6 shown as a man who was full of faith, the spirit, and had wisdom as well. And he was amongst the first group, as I mentioned, of deacons who were appointed by the apostles. And so that was a very special group of men to be included inside of. And then he was arrested and tried by the Sanhedrin in Acts the sixth chapter. He is teaching about Jesus, and he starts to get into some, there's others who came to challenge him, and he's in this, this dispute, and the others couldn't, um, couldn't make any headway on his arguments. He really kind of just took them down, and that made them mad. And so there was false witnesses brought, and uh, and it's, the Bible says that he was brought before the council, which we can understand as the, the Sanhedrin council. And Stephen is the first Christian martyr inside the Bible. He's killed after this trial goes on. And a part of that, we encounter for the first time this gentleman named Saul, who later, later becomes Paul, not becomes, but is, is called Paul later on. He is consenting to Stephen's death. Now, this, this role of Saul consenting to, to Stephen's death, I don't know exactly what, I wanted to dig into it more, but I don't know exactly what his function was. You know, as far as the Sanhedrin court goes, I read some scholars, you know, talking about how typically members of the Sanhedrin would be married individuals, um, often, you know, fairly well established. Saul was a, you know, likely a bit younger. He's described at the end of Acts 7 as being a young man, and so his 
age, you know, I don't know if it's a, it's a huge factor, but there's a variety of different things. We know that, that Saul was not married, it's documented in 1 Corinthians, but what his role was was influential. We know if nothing else, he was incredibly influential, and that is something that, you know, throughout his conversion process, before Saul becomes a Christian eventually, in his conversion on the road to Damascus, he had quite a bit of influence just overall in his life. This was a man who he had a Jewish heritage and background. He was clearly a Pharisee leader. He was trained as described, as he self-describes uh, in Acts, the 23rd chapter, um, verse 6, and then Philippians 3 and verse 5, as a Pharisee. And he was very strict inside of this sect of Judaism. He even studied with a man called Gamaliel, who is a very well-respected individual uh, teacher inside of the Jewish Jewish community, and, and he learned Jewish law in a, in a deep way as Gamaliel with his mentor. Acts, the 22nd chapter in verse 3, mentions you know, Gamaliel inside of, of um, you know, Paul's journey as being a teacher. Now, Gamaliel was a member of the Sanhedrin and a leading authority in Jewish thought, and so there could be a part of Paul's influence, you know, just based on who all he had connections with. He also was fluent in Hebrew and Greek, well-educated as a Jew, and this allowed him to be able to um, really be a bridge between the Greeks and the Jews and his ability to be able to engage in both different language um, it removed a lot of barriers and allowed him to be able to connect with Gentiles over time. And of course, he was a Roman citizen. It's suggested, you know, in, in all kinds of different ways about his upbringing that he was a person likely of very high social status. So he lived in, he was born in, in Tarsus, which was a, a free city. It's today known, uh, it's tar, you know, modern day Turkey is where it would present itself today. And um, it's known for its education and culture, according to Acts 21 and verse 39. But being a free city, this was a city protected by the Roman government, but that essentially they got to be able to govern, the, govern themselves. And so there was a, a high amount of honor that came along with being classified as one of these free cities. And so this, again, shows you know, quite a bit of privilege for Paul to be, be born inside of a city like this and to be a Roman citizen. As mentioned, he is mentioned as a, a young man in Acts, the seventh chapter, in verse 58. And scholars speculate he's probably in his late 20s or early 30s um, as it's going through. And th that was an interesting one for me to look at because... In 2 Timothy, Paul wrote his last letter that's found in the Bible, and he was executed during the time of Nero's reign, which was around 64 to 67 AD. So he died likely somewhere in his mid to late 60s. And so when Paul describes himself as an old man in Philemon, the first chapter and verse 9, you know, he maybe was in his 50s or 60s. It's, it's hard to be able to say, but, you know, he, he wasn't somebody who just lived into, you know, the deep, deep states of his life. He dies fairly, uh, fairly young, all things considered. And um, so likely here probably is his early, early 30s, I would guess, um, he, of course, was a tent maker later on in life. I don't know if he was a tent maker at this given point in time or if that came later on, but he obviously had training throughout that. He's a persecutor of the church. In Acts, the seventh chapter, we 
finds the beginning of this role, and it goes all the way throughout Acts 9, where we see him writing a letter to the Sanhedrin, getting permission to go and to persecute the, the church even further. And then, of course, we mentioned that consenting to Stephen's death. A lot of things going on with these two individuals. This lesson here is what Stephen taught and were his last words before he died. And so during his trial, Stephen is accused of a few different things by his false witnesses that were coming forward. Some of the primary things are related to him you know, preaching about Jesus and saying that the law of Moses was, was no longer needed. And those accusations, uh, all things considered, dead on. Uh, he, he wasn't teaching that the law of Moses should be the ultimate authority anymore. But in many ways, you know, this focus on, on the law is where Stephen builds the motivation for the beginning of his lesson. He starts into a history of the Bible leading up to where they are today. It all began with his narrative around Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And so we have this Abrahamic uh, you know, covenant that is, is created in the covenant revolving around circumcision and God's promise to Abraham relating to the lands of Canaan, the land of Canaan and to the people in which would come from Abraham, so the generations that would follow. This all led to eventually inside of this, this circumstance course. I don't know if my little PowerPoint pointer Let's see if this one works better. Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna not play with the laser pointers because I'm afraid I'm, I'm gonna blind myself or get something wrong. But with here, Joseph it has the twelve patriarchs. Joseph was the eleventh son of of Jacob, and then the youngest was Benjamin. And this is where we get the twelve tribes of Israel. Now, Joseph, his tribe is actually split into two. We have his two sons who are half-tribes of Israel, and, uh, and they are referenced often as the house of Israel. And all of this is just giving through the story. Those, that specific um, fact is not mentioned here, but it's talked about how Joseph's brothers became jealous of him and sold him into slavery and then God gave Joseph favor before Pharaoh. So what's a theme that we already are starting to see? He's describing God's plan and how it's leading to the laws and the, the covenants in which were being fulfilled through Jesus. But also we have these people who are God's chosen or delivered individuals that are being rejected. They're being rejected, and they're being um, you know, pushed away inside of this, and yet God sees his plan through even as these individuals are going through trials, and he does it through often the most unlikely candidates. And of course, over time, when Joseph gained, gained you know, favor with Pharaoh. He was appointed as governor, and this eventually led to, a, you know, when a famine happened in Egypt, his family ended up having to come to him, and there's all kinds of different things that go on, but over time, his family ends up moving to Egypt, and that's where they all, uh, you know, live until, until they die. And eventually, there came along a Pharaoh that didn't know Joseph and his family and the Israelites, because of the good favor that they had had through Joseph, they had grown tremendously. And Pharaoh decides that he 
is wanting to be able to kind of kind of nip this in the bud and make sure that the Israelites don't become too powerful. And that leads us to a time period of Moses that's being discussed inside of the lesson. Moses is protected from the laws that Pharaoh puts on to be able to say, hey, I'm just going to kill the Israelites' children, and, and uh, that'll, that'll slow down this population growth as they go forward. And Moses is put in the, the river, the Nile River, and he is found by Pharaoh's daughter. And Pharaoh's daughter ends up adopting him, and so Moses grows up as a prince. And there's a lot that happens inside of Stephen's lesson related to Moses. Now, I'm trying to recount as much as I can. I'm, I'm probably ending up belaboring it more than if I were to just read the chapter out loud to you all. But I think some of the, the core takeaways as we go through is that we see God's promises being fulfilled through all of these different individuals. It goes all the way through Joshua and the land of Canaan, and then we see David and Solomon, and it all eventually goes to Jesus. So why did Stephen teach this lesson? Well, at the end, Stephen actually rebukes the people there who have him on trial. He reverses the trial back on them, and he is telling them some bold statements, even saying that they are stiff-necked or stubborn people, uncircumcised hearts and ears because they always resist the Holy Spirit, and he links it back to the ancestors and the patterns in which he outlines inside of the lesson, and that's what we see through this narrative, especially during that time period of Moses. There's a pattern of people, the children of Israel, rejecting God's chosen and rejecting God's plans. At the very end, in Acts 7, the 7th the chapter, in verse 52 through 53, it says, Which of the prophets did your fathers not persecute? And they killed those who announced beforehand the coming of the righteous one, whom you have now betrayed and murdered, you who received the law as delivered by angels and did not keep it. And as we mentioned earlier, typically the courts weren't allowed to you know, do corporal punishment. They had to go to the Romans to be able to do that. Well, there's really kind of a mob-like situation that starts to form here, and they become enraged at what Stephen's taught, and that is when we see um, Stephen be stoned. And Saul, Saul is there that whole time. He hears this whole lesson as he goes through, and he's the one, of course, consenting to his death. I just thought this was kind of interesting, looking at the bulk of where Stephen spends his time. We have eight verses that talk about Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, nine verses that go through the story of Joseph, and then 28 verses that are spent on Moses. And so a lot of time spent on this story of Egypt and going out into the wilderness after the Exodus, and then a few verses that come across looking at Joshua in the land of Canaan, and then David um, and the temple. This is the last note I'll make about the lesson of Stephen, just because I thought that it was interesting. With the accusations, they, they were arguing with Stephen originally inside of the temple, and there's so much of the faith of this religious um, leadership group that is founded and centralized at this time period on the temple itself. And Stephen essentially goes through and tells them God, God existed with the children of Israel before the temple. He, he dwelt with the children of Israel in the tabernacle. He was there with Abraham. We see God 
showing his presence in different ways. And instead of focusing on God's plan and God's will, you're putting your faith in things like the temple instead of God himself. And that is part of the reason why they were so heavily rejecting this new time period where Jesus was the central part of it. We become living temples as we go through, and the, the temple and the sacrifices revolving around it weren't necessary. So just an interesting area that he, he really touches on a sensitive uh, piece at the end, the very end of his lessons, the last two verses that we read, and then he talks about Jesus and, and tells them that they murdered Jesus. And so uh, just kind of an interesting distribution, though, in how he spent his time and focus, um, but because so much of the accusations were related to Mosaic law, Stephen really puts on a master class showing them, you want to talk about Moses? Well, I'll, I'll tell you about Moses. Now, some of the core purpose and takeaway, we have reminders of God's promises to Abraham. The story of Joseph shows the beginning of that pattern we just talked about. Moses shows a long pattern of Israelites rejecting God and God's chosen. That temple note that I just made there. And, uh, and then he tells them that they rejected God just as their ancestors did, convicting them of killing Jesus. So that's kind of the highlight summaries of what we went over. Now, Paul, his lesson in Acts the 13th chapter is not the first lesson that he taught after being converted. Paul, inside of his conversion process, he had killed many Christians leading up to his conversion. And of course, this road to Damascus where Jesus appears before him is, is something that would... Um, surprise many individuals who would come across him after that. People knew he was a persecutor of the church, and it, it, made, uh, it made some challenges for him as, as he you know, was making changes in his life, and yet it never slowed him down from teaching the word after he became a Christian. In Acts 9, we have verses describing that Paul started teaching in the synagogues straight away about Jesus. And yet, the very first lesson where we have really the transcript of what he taught is found here in Acts, the 13th chapter. This lesson is, is very different than Stephen's in many ways. And yet, there are an incredible, incredible number of similarities that I find inside of these lessons. And this is speculation on, on my part. But I have to think that as Paul was going through his journey, I would imagine he thought often about that day with Stephen. I imagine he remembered that lesson fairly well. And where Stephen ended his lesson talking about Moses and then a few verses related to the promised land and David, it looks, looks in many ways like this is where Paul picks up his lesson and starts his lesson here. He begins talking about the Exodus and then quickly mentions the time period in which the Israelites were dwelling in the land, uh, or, or, or were um, uh, in the, dwelling in the wilderness for 400 years. And then he mentions the journey to Canaan. So we don't have the direct mention of Moses' name or Joshua's name inside of Acts 13, um, as Paul starts, but he's directly referencing those events that those men were a part of. And then he talks about Saul and David. Now, this is where we see a, a switch in the focus of the narrative. David is referred to inside of Stephen's lesson in reference to David and Solomon focusing on the temple. Saul and David are mentioned inside of Paul's lesson in focusing on 
the lineage that led to Jesus. And then the rest of the lesson is talking about various different aspects of Jesus' life. So Jesus and John, uh, John the Immerser, talking about the beginning of his ministry, and then the fulfillment of the Abrahamic promise that Jesus um, had and, and eventually leading to his trial and his death and the Jews' rejection of Jesus so that he can finish out the lesson talking about Jesus' resurrection and the promises in him. And now that, that category, I encapsulated a number of things at the end of the chapter. And so I did want to read Acts 13, verse 30, 32 through 41, because I think that it captures quite a few different um, ways in which he wanted people to know Jesus. Acts 13 and verse 32 through 41 says, And we bring you the good news that what God promised to the Father, this he, was, he has fulfilled to us, their children, by raising Jesus, as also it is written in the second psalm, You are my son, today I have begotten you. And as for the fact that he raised him from the dead, no more to return to corruption. He is spoken in this way. I will give you the holy and sure blessings of David. Therefore, he says also in another psalm, you will not let your holy one see corruption. For David, after he had served the purpose of God in his own generation, fell asleep and as laid with his father and saw corruption. But he whom God raised up did not see corruption. Let it be known to you, therefore, brothers, that through this man forgiveness of sins is proclaimed to you. And by him, everyone who believes is freed from everything from which you could not be freed by the law of Moses. Beware, therefore, lest that is said in the prophets should come about. Look, you scoffers, be astonished and perish, for I am doing a work in your days, a work that you will not believe, even if one tells it to you. So fairly, fairly powerful words and a warning there at the end for those who would choose to reject. And this was a very effective lesson that took place. The Jews who heard it, many of them were converted, and the Gentiles requested that there be teachings, that, that they come back to the synagogue and teach the same thing to the Gentiles. And that's what they did the next day. And they, the Bible says almost the entire city came and heard them teach. And it was at that time that some of the Jews became jealous of that attention. And they started to um, try and combat some of the things that were being taught. It's always interesting to see how um, power, attention, influence, how really motivating those things are for, I would say, all of us. It's, even if it's not something that at the forefront of our minds we think, oh yeah, you know, that's a big motivator for me. That is a huge temptation for, I mean, throughout the scriptures, we see people struggling with that as their primary struggle. Definitely something to, to think about and keep in mind. But I wanted to look at some of these bullet points just side by side. These lessons, although very different, have a tremendous amount in common. And, uh, and here, I wanted to just show, and it may be a little bit small on there, but the green panels are some of the crossover areas that we see. So at the beginning of Stephen's lesson, 
We have Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, Joseph and his brothers. Paul doesn't really mention Joseph and his brothers, but he even does mention Abraham later on in connection with Jesus' fulfillment of that promise made to Abraham. We also see um, not a tremendous amount dis discussed about Moses, but Paul's lesson starts with the Exodus and the time period in the wilderness, and it moves on to talk about the land of Canaan, and then eventually diving into David. And so subtle differences inside of the focus areas of some of those different parts. But again, it, it's for me, it, was, it, it hit me when I was reading through these lessons side by side that these men taught. And it really does. It feels like, like Paul was, in, in some ways, picking up where Stephen had left off. And of course, both lessons eventually lead to Jesus. And so I want to spend the last kind of portion of, of this comparison trying to be able to understand where there were similarities and differences between the two things being taught. Both looked at the history and the scriptures. We see the story of the Bible being told throughout the lessons, and both of them led to Jesus. And it's interesting, both of them were given to Jewish audiences. They were initially taught to the Jews, and this is, this is how it was instructed to be, first to the Jews and then to the Greeks. And the audiences, the audiences had a tremendous amount of context that they knew ahead of time. And so when we're thinking about teaching and being able to spread the gospel, we need to think about common ground that we can start with people on. What do people know already about the Bible? What do they not know? And where do we need to be able to start at in order to connect with them? And I have an answer we'll look at that is, uh, is a good starting place always for us. And we'll talk about that in this last section. But there's an interesting difference in the call to action in these men's lessons. Stephen didn't have a direct call to action. Stephen wasn't trying to be able to put up a defense of himself. Stephen was putting up a defense for Christianity, and he had a long-term focus. So he wasn't saying, hey, you all need to um, repent and be baptized today for the remission of your sins. He was telling them that they were wrong. And it's, it's important to be able to know who we're talking to when we're teaching. There are some people that if we know ahead of time, they're, they're not interested in what we have to say. Logic is not always going to be the answer. Stephen laid out exactly piece by piece where they were wrong, a detailed history showing a pattern of sin inside of their ancestors and showing where it led and what was going on. He spent the most time talking about Moses because Moses is what they were clinging on to. And so even though he didn't have a short-term call to action, he did have a long-term influence. And I think we can see that in someone like Paul. Again, Paul, after his conversion, he very clearly, even though he doesn't reference back to Stephen, he references back to what he did. He persecuted the church. He killed many Christians. And that was heavy on his mind throughout the rest of his life. And so when we think about someone hearing a lesson, even if, even if it's you know, not having an immediate call to action, it could have a long-term benefit. And we need to be able to think about the difference between who we're talking to and what the purpose behind our teachings are. 
And Paul, of course, did have a short term, a long term, long term benefit, but he had an immediate call to action. He entreated his audience to believe in Jesus, and this was again very successful as many Jews started following after those teachings after, and of course, Gentiles as well. He spent the most time of his story discussing Jesus. So he picked up in the, the portion where Moses was at, but then he focused on what was new, and that, that New Testament revolving around Jesus as the central part of it had to be focused on. So how do we continue the story today? In our lives, we can be like these men in the sense that if we know our Bibles, if we know the history of our people, which our people are connected all the way back to that lineage in Abraham, we also are connected to that promise When someone becomes a Christian, they become a part of the seed of Abraham, which was fulfilled through Jesus. We're connected to the story. We're a part of it. And so when we go and preach the gospel, we do the same thing that Stephen did and that Paul did, and we find our way to Jesus. Except for our story, instead of you know, picking up the story with Moses or uh, even, you know, David or some other portion, we can pick up where Paul left off and we can start with Jesus, tell people about the gospel. And again, it's going to depend on, on the audience. Maybe there's somebody where it would make sense to talk about Old Testament things in, in you know, relation to the story of Jesus. But whenever we're coming in contact with others, no matter what their background or perspective is, we always need to find our way to Jesus. He's where it centers around. He's where we have our hope, our salvation, and we, we have everything we have that is good in our lives because of him. The lessons that we teach also reveal the different pathways that people are going to respond. Not everyone is going to want to stone us, you know, if we, we tell them that there's change they need to make in their life. But not everyone is going to, um, you know, want to accept things straight away either. We have different reactions that people may have as we teach, but we know that the Bible acts as powerfully as a two-edged sword able to be able to pierce to people's hearts, and we know that it can make change. And no matter what we do in our lives, we need to preach. We need to make the gospel known. And so these are just a few takeaways that I think are important to keep in mind and lessons from both Acts 7 and Acts 13. Audiences will react differently. We saw that the Sanhedrin, the Jews, became angry. We saw that people who reacted to the whole city coming and wanting to hear um, Paul and Barnabas teach the gospel, they became jealous. So often people will react emotionally. But that goes for the gospel as well. When we have a fear, a proper fear of God, when we feel the love of God, when we feel encouragement or hope, those are reactional, emotional reactions as well. And so logic is important, but we have to be able to pair it with where people are at in their hearts as well. So both, both combined with each other. But no, people often first react emotionally, and then they think logically. We know that a change of heart may happen quickly for some people. Other people, it may take time, and it may have to work on them a little bit. But no matter what, 
again, the gospel is worth preaching. The gospel is worth preaching. And so that's what we do. And that's what we'll continue to do until the day that Jesus returns. These are my thoughts for this morning. I hope that they've been helpful in some way. They've certainly been helpful to me as I've enjoyed going through this study. We never want to be able to close service without talking about that, that gospel call. When we hear the word of God and we hear what Jesus has done for us, his death, burial, and resurrection has led to us being able to believe that he is the Son of God and being able to repent and be able to confess that Jesus is the Christ, the Messiah, the living God. And when we're baptized, when we're baptized, we become uh, Christians and we're added to the church. Now that we, you know, as humans don't add people, God adds people to the church whenever we're baptized and we have our sins forgiven and we're able to begin anew. Of course, there's many of us here who've already been baptized, and there are things that happen inside of our lives that sometimes may uh, lead us astray. Maybe we reacted emotionally to something. Maybe we, we just found ourselves um, going down the wrong pathway, having the wrong mentors, whatever the case was. I know that Paul probably had many things that were in his mind about his pathway as he went through. And so if that's something that's happened, then you have the opportunity, and you don't have to come forward during the service in order to be able to take advantage of it. But the Bible allows us to be able to confess our sins and being able to have brethren pray for us. So there's a pathway for that as well. And if there's somebody who does want the prayers of the church, has done something of a public nature, that you want to be able to confess and, and have the support of the whole congregation. These are the two invitations that we offer today. And so please, if you fall in one of either of these classes, come while we stand and while we sing. Just a